Welcome to the Inspiration for an Empowered Life podcast, sponsored by The Image Designers. They will help you look prosperous, feel prosperous, and be prosperous. Now, here's your host, the Image Master, Holly Porter. Hello and welcome everyone to another day at the podcast. So my guest today is PK Eastman, and she has been lots of things with me, working with me, doing lots of different things. But how are you today, PK? Hey, I'm doing good. My Hi. friend sent me a little thing this morning and said, uh, happy money-making morning, and I thought, or Monday. And I just, that just made my day. I thought that was so clever. I like that. I always that. get Mindset Monday. So that means work. But money-making Monday, mon well, now I can't even say it. It's a money making Monday. Ooh, it's like the trend. I liked it. I like it too. Let's let's keep that. I like it. Of course, I'm all about the prosperity now with my rebrand on my yeah. name. So that's awesome. There you go. Well, I'm happy you're here. And I just want the listeners to also know she is also one of the 4040 Rules authors in the volume one book. We'll have a volume two coming out this summer. And she was with the first one. And PK, tell us a little bit more about yourself. What gets you up every morning? <laughs> <laughs> well, you're a night well, owl. I will tell you. A bad question. I'm a night owl. So it's more like what keeps you up at night? Yeah. Right. Um, you know, I'm just happy. I, I've, I've always been optimistic, enthusiastic, and uh, high energy. I just was blessed with that. Uh, that set of gifts, and I, I've always loved that, and uh, I was reading something you wrote this morning, a post about so many women have gone through all kinds of, uh, the winner women, I can't remember what you call them, but successful women have gone through ups and downs and ups and downs, and I think I've just been through enough of those to know that if a downtime comes, it's, it's going to turn around and there's just no sense in worrying about it in, in the sense of, you know, hand wringing and all of that. It's just, well, how are we going to solve this problem? And so if, it, when I get up, I'm just happy to be getting up, knowing that there's going to be something fun during the day. And, uh, I made a gigantic move in my life about two and a half years ago. I had I was born in the Pacific Northwest and had lived in uh, Portland, Oregon. Um, went to college there, married there, raised uh, our family there. Uh, my children all went to the same high school I did, and and I know that in that time period, that even back then, that was very unusual. All of our neighbors, all of our neighbors were coming in and out and and you know, climbing corporate ladders, and my husband and I met as teachers. Then he moved into high tech with a company that was global, but their headquarters were in the Beaverton area. So we just stayed there and stayed there and stayed there. And he passed away, well, it'll be five years ago, I think this summer. And I just knew the minute I could, that I would get out of there. I'm not a gray, Give me any shade of blue and I'm happy. Give me gray clouds and tall trees blocking the light and I am not happy. My kids kept me happy and running around kept me happy, but there was nothing really left there for me. I did leave a son there and I'm sad about that. We want him to move, but you know, I just came to Southern Utah where the sun shines all the time and I love the red rock and I love the openness. I can't believe how claustrophobic Portland is. I went back about a year after and the tall trees were there it was in february one of the worst months and my friend and my cousin and i we had gone there because her dad was really ill and she needed a, a help driving and uh i'm not kidding we were climbing the walls we were in this gorgeous tuscan home uh of her ex-husband's sister uh, you know you know how families are these days oh, yeah. and so uh, but it was gorgeous, but it was dark wood and dark red upholstery and, and tall trees reaching clear up to the clouds. And I'm not kidding you, both of us, she's from Vegas. And uh, we were just climbing the walls, literally, to get, we wanted to see her dad, my, my brother-in-law or whatever he is, and uh, was. 
but we just couldn't wait to get back on the open road and head to the spaces. Sunny St. George, right? Sunny, beautiful, red rock country St. George, that's it. Well, it, ironically, um, just sharing with the listeners that you and I met at an event in Las Vegas out in the hall, just random, totally random, uh, an event of 400 people, mm -hmm. I might have, right? And we, we actually live exactly. in the same town. Like, it was so weird. It'd be different if, like, you met somebody in Seattle or Las Vegas, but we met in Las Vegas, and we were both from St. George, Utah. So that was just meant to be. It was great. Yeah, and, then, and since then, you I know, know. and I have had the opportunity to work a lot together, and so I've gotten to know her quite a bit, and I just want to share a little bit about, so, like, what you do. Your company's called Right Time Right Now. Like, tell us a little bit about that. Okay, well, it's right, like it's the right time to go shopping or it's the right time to start dinner. And then it's right time is the second half, which is writing. So it, it, visually, it's really stunning. And uh, I have to say, I, I'm normally not good with that kind of thing. I say, will you write this headline for me or that sort of thing. Um, but I, I will just tell you, it was inspired. I was helping a, um, a man, his wife wanted him to write his life story. And so I was doing that with not even thinking about it being a full-time business or anything. And, and one day I just was playing around and, and uh, it just came to me and I, I wrote it down and I loved the way it worked. And, and uh, it, worked. it stuck, it stays. So, like well, yeah, that was it. <clears throat> oh, I love it. So, so what kind of clients do you work with and benefit? Like, what do you, you do for them? Um, <clears throat> well, let me just tell you, I, my first professional career was as a high school English teacher. So I hope that doesn't make everybody turn off right now. I'm really a nice person. <laughs> and then late, a, a few years after I started teaching, I became a professional uh, mother and community volunteer and did that for a really long time. Uh, I didn't have, I was not, I was never gainfully employed as, as people were quick to point out. I did not get a regular paycheck from anyone, but nevertheless, I, you know, they say you need $10,000 or 10,000 hours to become an expert in something. So I had over 30,000 hours we calculated once in community service. So. I figured that qualified me to, yeah. to do a couple of things. I did go back to graduate school when I was 39, and I got my master's degree in social work, and I really loved that. And then I just, I worked within our church. Uh, I often assisted bishops with uh, problems with individuals in the ward so we could counsel together and, and figure it out. And what I learned through all of that was that our life, I, I was, I knew life was based on story before it became the buzzword in, in some of the industries yeah. because I taught stories and I taught students how to write stories as juniors and seniors in advanced placement classes. And then in the, in the therapy office, in my family therapy practice, everybody had a story. Now, in that situation, you had story A and story B and they didn't match. So we worked on how to get those stories to come together and blend and benefit those couples and those families. You know, the child told the story and the parents told a different story. And the truth was always, as we know, in the middle. And it was figuring out how to make those stories mesh so that they benefited people rather than tore them apart. <clears throat> you probably know this. I'm all about families. I love families. And the best families are those families that are well-connected. Doesn't mean they don't argue, it doesn't mean they don't fight, it doesn't mean they don't get mad, but it means that they're able to do that in a context of staying connected and, and being accepted in that family for whomever they are. So that's how I kind of got into this and it was writing stories. So I write stories. I have a 27 year old client <clears throat> who has some really strong views about medicating children. He was medicated with one medication piled on another from the time he was seven until he was 27. And um, finally, he just said enough is enough. It, it was ruining his life. So we're writing his story on 
what it was like to be medicated and have no voice in that yeah. and how he has recovered and what he's doing from a health perspective the he's eating different foods he follows naturopathic remedies for colds and flu and those kinds of things and so his story is really critical to a huge segment of the population i don't know the numbers for the united states yet, but i'm looking them up but i did hear a report a research report the other day and in england 65 percent of the grade school and junior high students well let's say grade school through high school students are on some sort of medication yeah that's not good i mean i will just stand up and say you know i'm a pharmacist daughter when I grew up, if it didn't come in a bottle from the pharmacy, it was going to poison you. My dad yeah. had an unbecoming word for chiropractors. Um, you know, they were charlatans in his era yeah. because they hadn't talked about improving that. So I'm not against certain medications. I take one myself and I'm really happy, but I'm not, a, I am not for piling them onto children when maybe a five mile trek around the track outside yeah. is really what they need or some ropes and ladders, maybe some hammers and nails. <laughs> if it's a girl, maybe she needs to make a mess in the kitchen, learning how to make a cake. So I think there are alternatives in medicine, you know, psychotropic medications work. So I kind of take the middle of the line, but this young man's story is fascinating. Wow. Um, so there's, uh, the saying is, I know you've heard this, everybody has a book in them. Yeah. And 99% of those people want to write a book. They don't know how, they don't know where, they, they have no idea how to get started. They just know that there's a story inside them. Sometimes they want to tell it just for themselves to get it out. And that's so therapeutic. It's really, uh, I think the clinical word is cathartic. You know, you write things out. So those are two kinds of people. There are people, I really love working with people uh, in the 40 to 50 age group because they are beginning to see where they are in life and maybe want to make some changes maybe they're not happy and they don't know how to make changes if we can start writing their story it isn't like oh i'm going to die at 52 so i need to get this down no 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 it's that you can really begin living a newer different life right at that age you can make adjustments maybe you're going along at 75 percent and one little tweak will raise your level of, of life enjoyment and therefore, I believe, life expectancy by just making a tweak or two. And we can look at that. Hard to look at that at 30 with, you know, a broader view. But by 40 and 50, we're beginning to see who we are. And, and I have found there are two kinds of people in their 40s. You either are still blaming your parents for being creeps or not doing right by you. Yeah. Or you have said, you know what, they did the best they could, they made some huge mistakes, and this is how it hurt me and my growth and development. I'm going to make some changes. Both of those people can write that story, because here's the secret. If you change the questions, you can change the answers. And when you change the answers, you are living a different life. So it's not, it's a legacy story in terms of, this is how I grew up and this is what happened. And now these are the changes I want to make or I have made and this is where I'm going. So they build a bridge there. Then you have the 60 to 75 or, you know, as we get older, maybe 70 to 85. Those people want to write their life story. And I, I'm a research person. I really want to know that what I'm saying is valid. I haven't just made it up to, to make me happy. And some of the research coming out of some of the universities right now is absolutely fascinating because it is showing that children that are raised in homes where there's an intergenerational connection. Now, grandparents may live in New York and the family lives in Texas, but there are ways to connect. And one of those ways is through stories. So <clears throat> people my age want to know the, the story of my parents. My parents are both dead, and so I'm having a challenge with that. So I know how much I miss not having that information for my children. They grew up without grandparents, really. Right. So, um, but these children are more resilient. And this isn't a story about, oh, our grandfather came over from Czechoslovakia, and, and he never did anything more than sweep the streets, and we've always been poor, and nothing good ever happened to us. No, that is really not the story. 
the story is grandpa came out, grandpa and grandpa came over from Ireland or wherever. And at first it was really hard to find a job. And then he was hired to do something at the shoe factory. I don't know, or the bakery. It really doesn't matter. And he found that he really had a love for that or his hands. It was, it, it kept his hands busy and he really loved that. So he just kept doing that. And let, let's say it's a bakery because that's an easy thing. So then things happen, the Dust Bowl or the Depression or World War II or the Korean War, it doesn't matter, but something happened and times were really tight. And so we moved from, from wherever we were out a little further west, Kansas or something. And there was no bakery there. So we started making bread out of our home together and then we made enough money, we opened a little shop. So it's the downs, it's the ups, it's the downs, it's the ups that gives context to the life of young people. So when somebody is down, they know that we can get back up. And these children are doing better in grade school and junior high. They're avoiding gangs at a higher percentage. They're getting higher grades and they're entering college and graduating with college, uh, you know, better job opportunities at the end of college because they're part of a bigger community. And it goes back to families, not, not just me, my husband, and our dog, which is a fine family, but these children that grow up in families that have intergenerational connections are grounded, I think that's a really good word, are grounded in a way that children that are just a part of a family that is isolated and doesn't have that level of connection with something greater. I don't know about you, Holly, but I think people are yearning to belong to community. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Don't you? And that's what these books do. You, it can help us identify our community. It can help us build our own community with other parents. And uh, <clears throat> Gosh, I'm so sorry. Um, it, it gives us a direction. We can say, I really want to be part of this community. Or I've been sucked into a community and everybody around me is negative and they've all lost their jobs or they're all divorced or... Right. They're all victims of abuse. You know, those things happen. They happen. And they're part of our story. We can own that without letting it own us. Absolutely. Okay. That's so, a huge difference. So who, who would be your ideal client? Well, I, I categorize them in three groups, maybe four. I have business people like yourself who have come to me and said, I want a book about my business. Doesn't have to be long. Let's, I will just tell you, I love words. I will write anything. You're awesome at words, that's for sure. <laughs> I editing is, a few of them. <laughs> I love editing people's work because it's like doing a crossword puzzle to me. And I will just say, every one of you have something you're a nerd about. You just haven't, if you don't know it already, you just haven't identified it. Um, so, but it is about that family and connection. So again, we have these young stories that people say, I have a story to tell because it will help people my age. Right. That's one kind of story. These people in 30, or the 40 to 55, 40, 45 to 60, that 15 year old group. We want to write, I'll tell you, it's a whole lot easier to write your first 40 years and then later write your next 40 years than to try to do 80 years all in once. So as a legacy book, it's just legacy part one, okay? If you're older and have never written, those people are prime and we have lots of ways. Like, My story doesn't matter. Yes, it does. Yeah. It matters to you. It matters to your family. There is no story out there. Think, how many times have you told the same story about Aunt, Aunt Julia or Uncle Fred or your, your mother or something? It's part of who you are and it's individual. It's a your story is like the snowflakes. You told your children every snowflake or your nephews or your class when you were teaching, every snowflake is different. Yep. We know everybody's fingerprints are different. Our stories are different and they are compelling to other people. When we have a yeah. and are in the, you know, whatever, the toilet, we pull ourselves out or somebody helps pull us out. That story teaches a lesson not only to you, but to somebody else. Absolutely. Oh my gosh, that happened to her? Right. I used to have a story and I was, well, I still have the story, but I was like, I'm the only one this happened to. And when I told the story, one of my sons, 
not my most sensitive son, said, Mother, you're not the only one. There are millions of women out there like you. Yes, there were. It doesn't minimize the story and it doesn't minimize the pain or the struggle or the recovery, but it helps to know I'm not doing that alone. And that's what our stories do for families. If you don't want to write a story, I'll just throw this in. We write legacy letters for people. They say, I don't have a story. And it's very interesting. They just want a letter. You know, grandma's pearls and grandpa's gun, they can only go to two people. One, well, they might both go to the same person these days. But, you know, those are two items, so two people are receiving them. A legacy letter goes to everybody. Right. This is what I learned. And this is why it matters. And this is what I want you to know, because I want your future to be better than mine. Yeah. Quit hating your uncle. He didn't, he was crazy. I, you know, yeah. your mom did the best she could. And I know that I, as a grandmother, I was partly responsible for that. But yeah. never doubt for one minute, we loved you. What a legacy that is to leave a child who, an only child who maybe doesn't have connection, a child who maybe has been estranged. And by child, I mean anyone from zero to 70, maybe 80. We're all adults or children. We're all adults with children inside and we're all part of some family. Yeah. So if somebody Our wanted regrets to get are, I'm sorry. Oh, I, if somebody wanted to get a hold of you. Our time's up, but and I love all this because it's so important to me as well. But if they want to get a hold of you, how would they do that, PK? You know what? We're working on a website. I, ha I just, I love technology, but I'm the simple kind. So I will just tell you, you can find me on Facebook Messenger at PK Eastman. You can get a hold of me through Holly. We're neighbors. Um, yeah. You can find me on Facebook. Um, I, oh, I should have done this earlier. We did this Facebook link below so they can grab it there as well. If you are that, me. I will. When, when we okay. Post it, yeah. You'll you can find me on Facebook, and if you, you know, if you find my feed, you can, you know, reach me there. But I love Messenger. Yeah. We can phone and talk. We can phone and do video, and we can just leave messages. So it's that's. I notice when I search things. you, I have to do the, I have to do p dot k dot, or it doesn't come up for me. Just so you know, if you're listening. Yes, and that was my mistake. On the website, we're going to clean that little mistake up. I mean, it's not a mistake; it just makes it more complicated. Oh, yeah, it's just harder to search. And so I, even though you should be popping up all over mine all the time, I, when I search you, sometimes that's what I ha forget I have to do. So yeah. just a little reminder, but well, oh my gosh. So yeah, we could talk about this forever. <laughs> um, so if anyone wants to get a hold of her, send her, send PK a message on Messenger and she's really good at following up and keeping through and you want to talk to her, you know, maybe about a book that's inside of you, your story, your legacy. <laughs> Definitely, uh, she's she's the gal to talk to. She she always makes me sound so much smarter. <laughs> oh <laughs> no, a I'm a simple girl when it comes. I just like get get it out, say what you got to say in a little bit of words, and she can totally expand it into a whole book. So it's a way to be. Anyway, thank you so much. Anything else? Oh you gosh, I'm so grateful that you asked me to be a guest here. Yeah. It's been a pleasure. Oh well, it's awesome, and it's never enough time, but. I know, I know people have lots of things to get on with their day. Sure. So I hope everybody enjoys their day, and thank you for joining us, and we will see you next time. Thanks, PK. Hey, invite me back. I love you. Bye-bye. Love you. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Inspiration for an Empowered Life podcast sponsored by The Image Designers. They will help you look prosperous, feel prosperous, and be prosperous. You can learn more about them at theimagedesigners.com or email holly at hollyporter.com.